Hi, welcome. Um, I'm Fotini Markopoulou. I want to talk about uh, technology and what makes us human and what would technologies that enhance our human side may be like in the future in this environment uh, that is dominated by technology that we live in. So as an introduction, I'm a physicist by background. Uh, I was in academia for 15 years. And in the last five years, um, I'm part of a tech company that we are creating this emotional second skin, if you like, um, that can enhance decision-making and mental health and just a sense of balance. So I guess I'll start with why I love technology. It's actually a very core thing to what we are as an animal. We are this special animal that makes tools. We make technology, we always have. Um, that's what technology is, is tools. And the thing is that we make our tools and the tools always change us. So when we first make tools to kill animals or make more tools with, that's how we evolved thumbs so that we could use our tools better. And it's always been like that. We co-evolve with our tools. The technology evolves, we change with it. When we think about technology, we tend to think of our phone or, or the, the electronic stuff that we use or um, maybe a power plant. But actually there are pretty much everything that we make, that we design is technology. The tools is what sometimes is called physical technologies, is different ways that we organize matter into forms that we can use for a certain purpose. But we also create social technologies, ways to organize ourselves. Um, for a purpose, whether that is a tribe um, that uh, grows stuff or hunts stuff or um, a tribe that creates um, new software, um, a supermarket. There is a patent for the first supermarket where you go around and pick up your own um, groceries and then you take them to check out. These are all technologies, ways that we organize ourselves or we organize the world around us. And so technologies are in layers um, down to governance and culture. These are all forms of technologies and they all interact with each other. They're, all these layers talk to each other constantly. And through this process, we change in many levels from actually physiologically changing to how we interact with each other and how we think of ourselves. So in some sense, that has always happened. Um, and uh, there is a lot, of, um, a lot to be said about the argument that, you know, we always talk about technology and something special happened. Now, no, nothing special happened. Major changes have happened before. They can look scary. They can look amazing. Uh, is there anything special about this time? And there's an argument that there is something special about this time. And that is the, between the power of AI and the data science, we have, at least in some areas of our life, we have technologies where the power of the technology is similar. So the same order of magnitude as our own. So the AlphaGo example is a case of that. AI has, of course, its limitations. I'm not going to talk about AI and what it can do. I'm going to focus on what it might mean when you have technologies whose, if you like, cognitive power is uh, similar to ours and what, what consequence or what choices might we have in that landscape. That is the basic question that you sometimes have to stop a little bit and think with the stuff that we are making, since we're always co-evolving with this, what is it that we will co-evolve to with the technologies that we are creating? And sometimes, especially in the space that I work in, there is uh, this cyborgy vision of ourselves in the future where, I don't know, we plug in devices or machines uh, 
um, I mean, I'm already enhancing my brain with Google. It knows so much more than I do. I don't need to remember where anything is because Google Maps is going to tell me. So these are all extensions of our cognitive powers. Are we going to be evolving in the cyborg direction or what? And in some sense, you know, the, when we create technologies, we are the creator. And the, the, the question is an old one. Um, it, it's, are we going to um, make machines, tools in our image? Or are we going to worship the machines and try to make ourselves in the image of the machines because they seem so incredibly powerful? So is this going to be a, a future of uh, human-like machines or machine-like humans? Now, one of the things that is, I think, psychologically very attractive to uh, the data science and the idea that some machine somewhere can crunch insane amount of data and give us answers is the context, is the world that we live in. We are hyper-connected, we are always on, and the world seems to just be more and more messy. It's harder to make sense of it. Everything is changing all the time. Workplace, the future of work is unclear. The, there's economic and social uncertainty. A lot does not make sense. I have a complex systems background and I might just say, well, it's a complex system and at this point it's highly interacting, but actually most of the time it just looks confusing. And so in this environment is not a huge surprise that we feel out of balance, uh, unhealthy, the mental health problems are going through the roof. Seems like we want to get a grip on things or somebody to give us some answers, uh, a path to follow in this world that is changing so fast all the time. And it, there's a funny way in which personal tech has inserted itself in this. Um, but one should look at what has actually happened. The key driver behind most personal tech that we interact with is optimization. That means that the algorithms that go through what are the new features to add to um, a, a tech that a human interacts with, um, optimize for how much time somebody spends using it, because that generally translates into dollars. In fact, the key driver always is optimizing for dollars. And in this process, uh, a strange thing has happened. The science of behavioral psychology came in and gave answers on how to tweak or design, create technology that attracts people's attention. The book Hooked by Nira Yao was incredibly um, influential. And when it came out, it was like, oh my God, it's amazing. You know, you, there's all these things that you can put in your solutions so that people get hooked. It actually says it on the front page, how to build habit forming products. It seemed like a great idea because you can build gamification, you can build ways to grab people's attention and then they keep using your product. And of course, the dollar stands come in. Now, a little bit, a few years later, uh, we realized that actually hooked actually meant hooked. And what these products do is literally they hijack your reward system, your attention. Uh, physiologically, it's just like addiction. You get dopamine spikes and you're addicted to the loops of the dopamine spikes. So these are electronic addictions. At this point, we all know this. It's important to remember that actually it's still the optimization for attention is still the main driver behind most of uh, the personal technologies that you have. Now that we know it, what do we do? Well, depends uh, what your life is like. So if you're lucky enough to be able to have the time and mental space to do it, you can do digital de detoxes and you can meditate and you can have your space for yourself and your children um, away from the technologies that try to grab you, to hijack you. But most people are not in this universe. 
The main solution is more tech, which now is trying to make up for the other tech. I'm not completely sure how it works. The, the way it works, really, is that... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.